Hey, this is the profit with Nick Black. It's time to chit chat. You know nothing about blockchain. We here to fix that. You want the news on them new stocks? This where you get that. So go and grab you a nice chair. It's time to sit back and talk to profit. Hey, hey, he talking to the profit. Hey. You talk, we talking condos and nice clothes and dropping Lambos. I remember them night codes, we couldn't stand those. We tried to drop on them house roads, but had to stay low. Now there's solutions to hard bills we couldn't pay for. I talked to profit to get some profit, we couldn't change the top. If it's a stock and I need a cop it, I wait for him to drop it. Ain't no option, let's get it popping, we chilling in the trap. I need some crypto playing in my pocket, by any means I rock. This is the profit with Nick Black, it's time to chit chat. You know nothing about blockchain, we here to fix that. You want the news on them new stocks, this is where you get that. So Go and grab you a nice chair. It's time to sit back and talk to profit. Hey, hey, you talking to the profit? Hey, hey, you talking to the profit? Okay, let's see. Real quick. Uh, let me make some adjustments here real quick for anybody, um, that was part of the singularity airdrop you have until tomorrow to like reaffirm, like claim, sign up for it. You don't have to claim the tokens, but you have to sign up and get eligibility. So just go on to the, uh, airdrop.singularitydow.ai, hook up your MetaMask wallet and it will check you out and see if that if you're in that group, uh, you had to be, you had to have AGI before. Uh, well, there's there's another way too, but the main way is you had to have it own it in either a wallet or on Singularity Net before April 17th of this year. So if you did, you get some free Singularity DAO, which has already done a 5x, so it's done 500 percent. But you're getting the tokens for free, so that's cool. But I think this token is still a really good buy. It's super cheap. It's still a, it's a buck twenty, buck eighteen, buck nineteen. So I think it's still a good deal. Anyway, there you go. Cool. So that's the Singularity Dow little update thing there. Okay, um, we will talk about prices in a second. Let me say hello. Let's start over here on the YouTube's. We have Scott. Oh, let me get some cool music. Oh well, you know. We can't get any show started without our ode. LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James, LeBron James. <sighs> a little, uh, a little LeBron James churching. Okay, let's do that. Okay, uh, Scott, what's going on? Biotech breakout. Brady, Todd B, Joe Fernandez, Kionda. We got Hoop and Tony, Michael. We've got Belinda darting uphill, Scorpion, Antonio, and Nesh. Good to see both of you. Uh, Dan, Bobby, what's up? Over here on the other side, over on the Thetas, we have Hans Van Kalen. What's up? Beach Girl, Hush Hush, Shata, uh, Biotech Breakout, JD SGC, Andy Panda, Baykeeper, Stress Relief. Antonio, of course, uh, Spirella. If I said Spirella, Belinda Cook, did I say those? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. There we go. So we got everybody. S2K Hobo, what up? Okay, cool. Uh, throw some likes on there. It's funny. There were two people I banned. I kind of booted them out yesterday because they were putting um, like links to like sketchy stuff in there. So I banned them and I got two thumbs down. Uh, those, those guys. Okay. Uh, Gordon Bennett, good to see you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. I was going to mention, I was listening to, uh, Suze, uh, I was listening to um, <laughs> the uh, the testimony of Jerome Powell in front of Congress today, or in front of at least the, the commission that entertains him twice a year. And it's the same stuff. And it sucks because on some of the stuff I do kind of agree with Jerome Powell. I, I believe that most, a lot of this stuff is transitory. I believe that 
when you're saying, oh, there's inflation all over the place, well, then you really need to look all over the place. And if you look all over the place, it's not. Um, you have a few foodstuffs that have to do with supply chain logistics that are that are weird. You have lumber that was weird. The prices of lumber have gone down, but the manufacturers have to recoup those losses. Those things are going to slowly come back. And I'm sure they'd love to keep those prices high. But right now, um, those are passed through. Those are transitory. And if you were if you're buying lumber new, like right now, the prices are back down. But lumber that's in the supply chain or that's being used on houses, those prices are higher because that's already been purchased. So that's weird. Rental cars, new vehicles. Why? Because superconductors got log jammed, and so there's no new vehicles coming out because they're all chip based. And so since there's a you know a constraint on new vehicles, of course the used car market skyrockets. It's up like 14%. Okay, yeah, that looks bad. Not month on month, although it is up way up in June. Uh, June was a big month for used cars. Well, it makes sense. It's the summer. People want their cars. They have all this extra free money that they shouldn't have. They're behaving like idiots. So you have bad behavior. You have transitory effects. You have supply shocks and all this kind of stuff. All of that is true. But that's not that, you know, industry-wide, market-wide, sector-wide, pervasive, constant in, uh, inflation effects. That's not what that is. And it's not all foods. People are like, oh, man, food's up. Food is not up, dummies. Food is not up. A in a particular few places, wheat, corn, things like this, yes, there are some little bitty ouchies. But don't go spread the bogus inflationist of garbage Inflation's not here, brother. Bro, bro hams and and what is it? Bro, bro, bro sisters, bro, sis hams. I don't know what we even say. So, and yeah, that's right. The car industry is obviously look. There's all sorts of perverse incentives. Everybody's taking advantage of this. Everybody is. They're all doing what? Game theory. They're maximizing their their payoffs. So, is the car industry taking advantage of this? Sure. Is the housing industry that's that's gone way up? Why? Because people have extra money they shouldn't have for down payments. So of course people are behaving. They're behaving in a way that that the bad behavior because of all this stimulus is creating these effects that look a lot like pervasive insurance, uh, pervasive inflation. It's not that. Um, but if enough people believe it is, they can start to create. This permanent effect that is so fake inflation and the perception of inflation can become inflation, right? Perception becomes reality. So I'm not saying it won't ever come. I'm just saying what you're seeing right now, don't buy into it because in on this one thing, I believe Jerome Powell's correct. But the assumption of inflation by the rubes and continued bad behavior and continued I mean, if they do another six trillion and another six trillion, if we do this twice a year or even once a year, how many six trillions can we add? And then, man, what happens if we bail out the boomers with the pension funds, um, bail out uh, corporate debt downgrades, bail out uh, Social Security and, and pensions and all? I mean, Jesus. Then, then we have 100 to 150 extra trillion, not counting the constant trillions. In, in a lot of states now, people with kids, which that's a lot of people, every kid gets you 100, two, two, 300 bucks extra a month forever, forever, until the kids are what, 18? I don't know, whatever the number is, the cutoff. So now we're in the baby business. And you, and, Mm, it could it could start to go from what is the perception of inflation that's not real inflation to absolute freaking chaos. So I'm not one of these people that's saying it can't happen. I'm one of these people that's saying right now you're not seeing pervasive, constant runaway inflation. You're seeing log jams in logistics, but it could go the other way. I'm open to that. We all have to be open to that. Um. Dan, what's up? Can I dive into XRP not being spoken about much? Yeah, because there's nothing to speak about. Unfortunately, Dan, um, the people at Ripple are really sketchy. 
all of the things that they promised have pretty much turned out to be lies. Um, and we saw the fruit of their labor with the MoneyGram deal, which was a complete fail. They paid MoneyGram over $50 million to use XRP to save MoneyGram money, and MoneyGram decided not to use it. They sold it as quick as they could. They took the money. They said F you to Ripple. And you have to wonder, you know, at a certain point, if – if XRP was so valuable and if Ripple, the company, is so valuable to all these banking institutions and FIs, they have all these partnerships, right? How come no one's using it? No one is using it. Zero. Zilch, nada, nothing, dust, smoke. You know who was using it? Bread Garlic Mouth and Chris Grand Larceny to sell tokens at a discount to institutional investors so that they could then, those institutional investors, immediately sell on the market against you. So that Bread Garlic Mouth and Chris Grand Larceny could then go and look at the TV monitor on CNBC and tell them, we're not selling. No, you're not selling. You already sold. And the, and the worst part, Dan, is the same Ripple community that Bread and Grand Larceny directly undercut, directly sold against and lied right into their faces. These are the same people defending them. Talk about a bunch of freaking rubes. It's tough for me to talk about XRP without profanity. And unfortunately, the token has been – and now put all the bad behavior aside. Then you have the software question of whether XRP, and this is to an extent XLM – can really make the argument that they are good technology enough to compete with all of the new things that DeFi – basically, DeFi has displaced the need for bridge assets. We talked about DeFi yesterday. If you guys didn't see it, go back and watch that video because it's a pretty good breakdown of, the, of some of the risks of DeFi as far as like rug pools, flash loans, and you know liquidity pool rebalancing, like, like bad arbitrage, things like that. So um, – but – in the DeFi space, in this decentralized financial space, we're learning a lot about the way money works, the way liquidity pools work, and the way the future might look like working. <laughs> XRP questions will make Nick delete the video. That's funny, right? So as to the question of whether X – and this is an XLM question also, and this is any other of these bridge currencies. You, you no longer need – got to watch out because my cat's being a little bee right now. She's not having her play date because there's dogs over at the other house. So she's being quiet. She was pulling paintings off the wall earlier, so that's, that's a thing. Um, anyway, so XLM, XRP, and these other bridge assets, you don't need them anymore. And I would probably say that you didn't need them at, a, at about the middle to end of last year. No longer did people say, well, if we only had a bridge asset. No longer did people say, well, once CBDCs are everywhere, they will use, you know, these guys are like, they will use, absolute, they will use XRP. They will use XLM. They will use none of that because no government is going to trust a private company to manage their sovereign digital currency. They're just not going to. At the best case scenario, and this is not happening either, likely, is that they would fork one of those tokens and then push a stable coin onto that and maybe, hopefully, run some transactional current, some transactions through the XRPL or XLM's version thereof. But guess what? It's not happening. Because you don't need that technology anymore. You don't need currency number three to go from currency A to B. You don't need a third currency. You can just go, you can swap from A to B. That's it. This is not, you don't need XRP and you don't need XLM, period. I don't know what, I don't know why this is so hard for everyone to stomach. If you've got a lot invested in XRP, then I hope that you're hoping for something else that has nothing to do with central bank-backed assets, that has nothing to do with financial institutions leveraging it, that has nothing to do with exotic – I mean this. You need to really listen. Antonio, but turn the volume up so that your peeps can hear this. There is no reason 
that anybody will leverage, at least for the current intent. They're not going to leverage XRP or XLM for cross-border remittance because you don't need to. Does anybody here use XRP to swap currencies or do they just swap it in one inch, Uniswap, MetaMask, Pancake Swap, Sunday Swap, Sushi Swap? How many freaking swap platforms are there? I mean, come on, man. And Dan, I'm I'm with you on this one. I it, it it's a discussion that needs to be had because unfortunately, and look, you know, I I own some XRP right now. I'm not talking like out of my Wah, wah. I own some XRP. I've owned it. XRP made me a mint. I'm not an XRP hater. It's not XRP's fault. The currency's not to blame. It's two things. It's a little bit of bad behavior. And really more than that, even you can discount what Garlic Mouth and, and Chris Grand Larceny did. And it's technologies passed it by. It's a slower ship in the water. It's a sailboat. And, a, and all of the little speedboats, these swap platforms just went Meow, and just went by. And you say, oh, well, the fees. Yeah, but the fees will be returned to dust. The fees are already lowering. The fees are already getting lower and lower and lower. And, and what do you think happens when Polkadot and Cardano launch in a meaningful way? All those same swap platforms, they are going to be doing swaps with Cardano-backed uh, assets and Polkadot-backed assets and wrapped tokens of every variety. Everybody's going to go where the fees are cheaper. That's the only reason Binance Dumb Chain has had any success. The fees are lower. And a lot of people were like, look, I'm going to go use it. But you know what they're not doing? You know what no one is doing? No one. Even the people that, that Ripple paid, they're not using XRP. They're not using XRP because there's no, there's no incentive. You have to have some reason to use an asset to make your life better. And... But unfortunately, the XRP community is the same thing with the Link community. They all got sold a bill of goods, and they bought into it, and they have this weird dream that they're going to sit on their tractor trailers and that the, the, the 37 of them are going to inherit the entire planet when, when XRP goes to $7,000 a token. And they're like, well, they're just trying to make everyone sale so they can do a – so that – the XRP can take over that. Quit being a dummy. <laughs> That's the most ridiculous thing. And uh, it's it's kind of heartbreaking too because the people that invest in XRP, you know, I feel like if you could just shake them, like pour some cold water on them, maybe like slap them one or two times, they'd be like, okay, okay, I get it. I know. And it sucks because they were sold the dream, but the dream is not realistic anymore it just isn't they missed it technology passed them by could they come up with something different to do sure i mean ripple's a big company they're going to be doing software this is and that's they probably have board meetings three times a day where they go what the f are we going to do now that no one cares about using the xrpl for its old intention right and yeah they were well they were well-intentioned people but at the time I said this, I was pretty vocal, and I got basically banned from every group. I thought what Jungle Inc. was doing was incredibly uh, dangerous. Uh, Sam I Am, nice guy, I guess, but he sounds a lot like a psychopath when he's looking at pictures of like people wearing, you know, the cartoons wearing socks. It's like, well, there's three stripes that are black and two that are white. That clearly, that's a, that's a 60-40 spread. That means that 60% of the world's transactional, you know, crypt, uh, you know, swift transactions are going to go through XRP, but then only 40% are going to shut up, dude. And then that guy, he, I was trying to interview him. He won't, first of all, he won't do any interviews live because obviously, uh, and he won't ever, ever do an interview with me. Either will jungle. And I, I thought I liked these guys because I grew up in the XRP community as a big bag holder. And I think at one time I had over a million XRP. And because it was less than a penny. <laughs> so 
Yeah, Antonio just mentioned, you know, pivot back to cognitive bias. It, it is all cognitive bias. That's why we study cognitive bias. Um, anyway, so just be very careful. Um, just just always look at your investments and and try to make sure that they still make sense. Sometimes they don't. Um, and I, you know, it doesn't make sense anymore. And so I guess that's just a simple way to put it. But just make sure that it doesn't make sense. You know, don't do anything because I said, like if I said I hate XRP. That doesn't mean XRP is not going to 10 bucks. There's a lot of bad behavior. Look at what happened to Dogecoin, one of the most useless tokens on the planet with no cap, no management. And regardless of what you hear, Elon Musk is not his, – his days are not consumed by what he's going to do with Dogecoin. And the, and the last person you want is the 502 gateway error that is known as Mark Cuban being a champion because everything Mark Cuban touches turns to absolute dog – Poo poo. So just be very careful. This is a good question. I know we haven't even technically started the show. This is a good question. We're just not even. Is Sam Bankman fried legit? Looks like a David Schwartz hairdo. There's something very suspect about that dude. Something incredibly suspect. Uh, you know, where did where did they get hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars? to go and do partnership deals with Miami Heat, do partnership deals with like the whole city of Miami, with the NBA, with the NFL, with the, uh, the Major League Baseball. Like where's all this money coming from? No one uses, no one uses uh, their exchange. How'd they come up with the money to buy Blockfolio? No one uses his exchange. So, and who was using it? That'd be like if the people at Hit BTC were like, we now own – he was making a statement yesterday or the day before. He said, in, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to potentially buying Goldman Sachs. Shut the F up, dude, buying Goldman Sachs. Who do you think you are? This dude – something incredibly suspect. You know, when people just come out and start sponsoring, 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 you're like, but who, they are? who are they? They don't do anything. No one uses, no one uses their exchange. Like six people use it. I don't know, man. I've banged around on there. I was zero impressed. One of the coolest exchanges is actually KuCoin. But I'm sure FTX is 5,000 times bigger than KuCoin, right? Hmm. Uh, I don't know, man. The guy seems real sketch to me. So I don't trust him. I'm not putting any money over there. I'm not touching it. My name's Bennett. I ain't in it. Usually when I have these kind of uncomfortable feelings about people like I did with, I can go down the laundry list of people that I thought were scumbags and they turned out to be scumbags. Um, but he's definitely on the, I, I get a bad feeling about him, but he hasn't done anything bad, right? He hasn't, it's not like the guy's been busted for like, money laundering, drug conspiracy, working for Russian oligarchs or any kind of stuff like that. Like he just seems super sketch. I don't trust him. I don't trust the exchange and I haven't seen anything exciting about it other than the fact that you see his name everywhere and people are like, oh, what does Sam think? No one cares what Sam thinks because Sam is not an individual in the crypto space. He is a self-proclaimed individual in the crypto space. No one leverages his advice. No one listens to him. That's not fair. I can't say no one. Some people do. Mostly people don't listen to him. Mostly people don't care. Yeah, that's it. I'm getting the CZ vibe. Only difference is CZ built something. Now we know that it was, you know, mostly a racket and, and probably supported by a fair degree of money laundering uh, and, and backdoor rug pulling conspiracies and all that. But, um, there's nothing about FTX that's exciting to me. Who knows? A year from now, it might be the only thing in town. And then we find out, oh, there was some government behind it. The whole thing was uh, just a way to get it. Uh, doesn't matter. Anyway, okay, so um, I'm going to do my little commercially break thing, even though we've like droned on for like 20 minutes. Uh, interestingly enough, I'm just going to do a quick note. You know that the banking system that was supposed to be so safe – so you want to know why houses are going up? One of the reasons, one, one is people have down payments that they didn't have. 
because of COVID and some other stuff, people with a lot of money have more money. Why? Because nine out of every $10 that's supposed to go to the public actually gets rerouted and doesn't ever make it out to the public and goes back to a few people. Crony capitalism, the whole thing's rackets, Cantillian effect if you want to read about it. Money, people, people close to the spigot get to drink first. They get to drink pre-inflation, and that's what you're seeing. And rich people got really, really rich during COVID. And you might think, well, that seems – no one should have gotten rich during COVID. What should have been is that everyone was didn't lose ground during COVID. So if you hear, ooh, they got rich during COVID, that's, that's a misappropriation, misallocation of funds. That's money going in the wrong direction, period. And if you got good off of COVID, you got money you're not supposed to have. I would urge you to invest it or put it somewhere. Uh, so just be careful. Um, don't mistake the fact that they are, you know, spewing, uh, currency units into society in the wrong direction for the fact that you're doing better in life. And then you assume, oh, next year and the year after that, and the year after that, I'm going to be doing just as good. Uh, be very careful. Don't, you need to be honest with yourself, Right. Be honest with yourself. Well, the banking sector that was so that was so strong had such strong balance sheets. The Fed checked them out. Everything's fine. Do you know they needed three hundred billion dollars? I have three hundred million on there. Hold on, three hundred million. No, no, that's not right. Let me adjust this. Let me adjust this for you. I've got to make that the correct number. Boop, boop, boop. Here we go. There we go. That's the number. That's how many currency units the banking system lost. But it's cool, everyone, because they got it back in stimulus relief. The banking system, the ones that are right now posting earnings, better than usual earnings, they needed $300 billion in bailout. 300. Do you know how much money was pumped into the market after 9-11 to get the economy to like calm down? 9-11. 30 billion. So COVID, see if we can put this together. So during COVID, the banking system that was super liquid and didn't need any help, somehow they got $300 billion. Huh. I can't, I can't help but to think that, that the average person still gets charged overdraft fees. I guess that doesn't come out of that 300 billion. I can't, I can't help but to think that the banking system has been – they've been uh, deteriorating. They repealed Glass-Steagall. They've been uh, backing off of the Volcker rule. They've been making it easier. They, I mean the Fed and regulators, have been making it easier for banks to invest and gamble. Huh. But if, but if the banks were fine, why do they need $300 billion? What would $300 billion have looked like? out into into the United States. Well, that be basically about another $920, $950 to each American. But no, that goes to the banks. Isn't it weird that the average uh, CEO now makes, in the banking industry, by the way, uh, 229 times more than the average employee? CEO makes 220, let's call it 230. He makes 230X per year of what the employees make. Huh. And yet, you wonder where it comes from. I mean, they did get that 300 billion. So I guess that makes sense. But they were liquid. So why did they need the 300 billion? I don't know. It's really confusing. Oh, and did you guys know that one of the biggest investors that you're competing with in the housing market one of the reasons why housing is up 25% in a year. Did you know it's the same banking system? Did you guys know that? Is that crazy? So you wonder, of that $300 billion that they got that they clearly didn't need because Jerome Powell said they didn't need it because they were – they had stringent standards on, on liquidity and stress testing. So you go, well, they got $300 billion and it, and then – and then the housing market went up 25%. And then you find out that 
up to 60%, more than half of all the buying that's occurring is direct or indirect investment from the banking industry into housing. Huh, that's weird. That's weird. So stimulus money that was created to maintain some level of uh, stability in the home, as if you listen to the Fed, protect buying power, preserve, uh, uh, defend against the evil forces of inflation, defend um, for the American, and uh, keep them in their homes and keep. And weird though that three hundred billion goes into the banking system that didn't need three hundred billion, and then they start becoming one of the one of the marginal buyers in the housing market, competing with us. For housing, then the housing market goes up 25%. I don't know, man. Does that does that seem cool? Just a quick show of hands. Does everybody is everybody cool with that? Let me know. I'm cool with the banking system taking 300 billion in stimulus so that they can buy their own stock back, pay themselves bigger bonuses, make 230 times the average employee at their own company be the marginal buyer, the buyer of basically first resort in the housing market, competing against you for a house. I guess the whole idea of home ownership for the average American didn't make it to the game theoreticals of the uh, of the Federal Reserve. And I, I mean, and it's not just, this isn't just the Federal Reserve, this is Congress as well. And you got to wonder, wow, are there some, are there some sketchy incentives there? And, you know, you know who pointed this out? A congressman, yeah, Warren, who not always a fan of. You know what? She says some things that make a lot of sense. And I know that th this doesn't ever escape this discussion. No one really, people hear it and they go, uh, oh, mm, eh. I'm like, eh, <laughs> eh, <laughs> oh my God. And, and, and this is the problem. Yeah, you will you will own nothing and you will be happy. That's right. And you just got to think to yourself, are you okay with that? And it really, it really angers me. But it angers me kind of in a way like I'm not going to be like, err, and go kick something. It angers me in a way where I go, it's not, it's not a simple problem, obviously, Um these packages are giant, and in order to get these packages passed, every single senator, congressman, all that, they have to do all these favors. They have to go and and you know they have to appeal to their caucus, the people that get them voted and revoted and reelected. They have to appeal to their kind of their their you know there's all these little groups and all these little kind of little activism that happens inside Congress and the Senate when they're voting, you know, in the, in the, everybody makes these little side deals. I owe you this one for that one. There's a lot of horse trading. Politics isn't easy. I get it. Um, and their incentive structure is a little bit perverse and different in that they're just trying to get reelected and they're trying to stay in. Everybody owes everybody a favor. I get all that. Um, but banks keep getting bailed out over and over and over and this wasn't what this was for. This one particular thing, if you want to go bail out the banks, start a separate bill, put it in front of Congress, put it in front of the Senate, put it in front of the people. Okay, let me let's let's reverse this a little bit. What if we did have a central bank backed digital currency and we got to weigh in and vote on some of these measures? Let's say every time more than a certain amount of money is put into a program. We, you and I, owners of U.S. dollars, we get to vote. Don't you think that would be fair? Like a – like kind of like a DAO. What if we had input? So what if you got a little text message in the morning saying Congress and the people to vote on $300 billion banking bailout? You might say, oh, 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 I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I don't know if I I don't know if I feel comfortable about that. I thought Jerome Powell just said everything was fine in the banking system, that they had uh tons of liquidity. I mean, 
as Jerome Powell said less than a year ago, this was the biggest liquidity event since Noah's flood. So I don't so would you have voted to allow banks to would you have bailed out these banks' losses? Remember, the banks weren't going under. They just they just consumed three hundred billion dollars during all of this murkiness. And guess what? This is the best part. Did you know that those three hundred billion dollars in trading losses were not a result of COVID? This is the cherry on top. They lost that money in the normal course of business leading up to COVID. So we eat their losses. This wasn't COVID losses. We're eating their losses. <sighs> so S2K Hobo says, but wait, Nick, you also have to consider some people you're saying to vote. Yes, I agree. What I'm saying is, and I'm not saying that putting the vote to the public is the is the right way to do things. I'm saying, don't you think we should have some say? I mean, the same people that are buying Doge and XRP, they're probably still, well, I don't want to say they're smarter than the people in Congress. That's a tough one. Could go either way. Um, yes, there's a lot of bad behavior in the crypto space. But I'm not just talking about the crypto space. I'm talking about the whole everybody in the United States. The assumption that we get to vote. Shouldn't we also get to vote when we're bailing out companies that don't that don't deserve to get bailed out? I mean, I'd like to have a say in that. Maybe we do an IQ test and people that skew on the top one third of the IQ. Boy, this is getting into some stuff, but then we get to vote, right? We're the ones that get to vote on what they get to do with money. Uh, that'd be interesting. But long story short is, these banks sustain losses due to poor behavior, not due to COVID. Yet in this whole mix, in this ugly mess of getting a deal through, protecting the American household, all this, you know, all this kind of crap that they say. And, you know, you know, telling people like don't pay rent, stuff like that. You know, F the landlords, by the way, but telling people don't pay rent and all these kind of things that they did. But yet they do that, and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, I'm not paying rent. I'm going to smoke weed all day long. Woo, I'm going to listen to radio. I'm never going to go out of my place. Woo, 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 until I get kicked out. Woo, woo, September. Uh, I'm not going to work. I'm just going to collect the check. Da, da, da. Okay, cool, bro. Problem, problem is that during all of that, no one said, oh, by the way, we're going we're gonna to write a $300 billion check to cover gambling losses in the banking sector. Oh, by the way, we're going we're gonna to create, I don't know, a quarter of a trillion dollars, and we're going to go bail out junk bonds. Which ones? Well, who owns the most junk bonds? BlackRock. Well, we should just give BlackRock all the money. Oh, we did. We gave them – we put Fink – that's his name, BlackRock, in charge of buying into the junk bond market, government money. We gave him money to buy into the junk bond market. Guess what he did? Obviously, he bought his own junk. He bought his own ETFs. I'm not kidding. Not only did this dude not get a, go to jail, this guy got a high five. We gave him government stimulus money to the – to the dude that runs BlackRock to bail out the junk bond market, to bail out the junk bond market. And he took it and bought BlackRock's own junk bonds, their own junk bond ETFs. That's – how is that okay? I'm like, well, he just did – you know, what, what are you going to do? I, I don't know. Maybe don't put that guy in charge of buying his own fund. I mean, how much of a scam is, is it so bad that we can rationalize all of this bad behavior and just say, well, COVID, man, just, it's just COVID, just COVID being COVID. What, what has happened is COVID has been used as a blanket excuse for all kinds of bad behavior. And the thing is, I don't want to belittle COVID. I'm not one of these people that says it doesn't exist. It absolutely exists. It's killed a lot of people it's awful but that doesn't make you know it doesn't make it right that all of this money under the guise of of 
protecting the economy against the effects of COVID that we go around and we bail out bad banks, we bail out bad behavior, we cover all their pre-COVID gambling losses because that's what it is. The banks then take that money and they say, well, <laughs> let's go gamble again. So what do they do? They go into the housing market and they buy against you. They're buying houses against you. They're, you're competing with banks in the housing market. You're competing with banks in the car market. <sighs> what a racket, dude. This thing is just a racket. So that kind of stuff irks me. It makes me very irksome. I'm irksome. I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated by all of this bad behavior. So, yeah. And then you hear, you know, like, was it Shake Shack that was like buying up re uh, uh, real estate with, with uh, PPP money? And then they got called on the carpet. They're like, oh, oh, my bad. Oh, really? My bad. So let me guess. So you would have done that. You would have continued doing it, but you got caught. And now you realize you now you realize your mistake. Anybody that can hear this, don't ever eat at Shake Shack. Ever. Dude, those dudes are thieves. And guess what? If you're a small business owner, you're competing with them. And then they go and arrest this dude in uh, San Francisco, I guess, the guy that was making fake companies to get PPP money to buy Bitcoin. And he made like $2 million on it. And they're like, we're going to put you in jail. Oh, cool. Um, go put the guys at Starbucks in jail. Go put the guys at Shake Shack in jail. Go put every single bank CEO in jail. Like, come on, dude. Like, I get it. Now, he was actually starting fake businesses. But remember, a fake business that doesn't exist is only 2% less capitalized than the best capitalized bank in America. Isn't that crazy? If you have zero money, the best bank in America is only 2% better than you. Because <laughs> the best bank in America is only capitalized. Two, they only have about 2 bucks and 30 cents on every $100 they claim to have on their balance sheet. How is that cool? So if you look at this whole thing and you, and you back out, and you just kind of go up into the clouds and you look down. This thing is a rot. It is rotten. It is gross. It is perverse. It is broken beyond, I mean, I don't think you repair this. So what we will do is we will continue, I guess, no one knows, right? But it seems likely we will continue down the path of continued profligate government spending, profligate behavior, theft, greed, corruption, continued printing, continued stimulus continued and then that pervasive inflation that we're all worried about at some point it will outstrip it will outpace the deflationary effects of technology and logistics and less jobs in the human workforce because we'll just keep paying people more money to do nothing more money to do nothing more money to do nothing so the and you're going to have more people that have no job Nothing to do. They are now entrepreneurs, traders, day traders. That's their job. Davy day trader that have zero education. Well, why should I mean, but you know what? They have as much education as the people in Congress and Senate. And how I mean, well, it's the same. <laughs> they have the same no education. They have the same zero education in economics. They have the same zero education in cognitive bias, zero education in game theory, zero education in history. And they all say the same crap and they go home and they take their breaks and they do, and no one, everybody. So, so we're back up. We're like a bird in the clouds and we see all this bad behavior and we realize pointing it out like I've done, it means nothing. It means nothing because nothing's going to change. So we have to accept that this is the new normal. And there is a certain, there's a certain nirvana in that. There's a certain kind of like, okay, cool. I now know what the rules are. The rules are we're going to create currency units. No one cares about debt. No one cares about deficits, period. Yeah. So if that's the way it is, if lower IQ is the way things are, lower investor IQ, lower aggregate IQ, just in general, lower IQ, dumber humans, 
It's fine. It is what it is. Uh, and those people have more extra free currency units that are coming from somewhere. And we know that banks are, are two things. One, banks won't be allowed to fail. Little ones can fail. Provincial banks, credit unions, they can definitely fail. They will let them fail and they will be absorbed. Their, their assets will be absorbed into bigger banks. And eventually, my guess is, if you woke Jerome Powell up and the other Fed, you know, Bullard and these guys up at 3 a.m. and shook them, that if they had it their way, there would only be 12 banks, period. And those would be the 12 banks that make up the central, the, the, the Federal Reserve. That is not federal, by the way. So, okay, cool. Um, people don't care about owning stuff. Don't need to own a home. Cool, you won't. You'll be able to rent it from one of the banks, one of the 12 banks that's left that are run by the Fed. Um, and you don't want to work? Cool, you won't have to because they will keep printing up money and giving it to people. They're already talking about another three, three trillion, three trillion more right now because people are demanding it. I want more money to not do nothing. Universal basic income. Here we are. And even if it doesn't, even if they don't call it that, we're basically there. Uh, and this is just the way it is. And so you say, okay, cool. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fret. I'm not going to, there's no point being frustrated. There's no point being angry and calling people on the carpet. None of it matters because no one cares because everybody's in on the perverse incentives. Everybody is in, everybody is in on the perverse incentives. So, okay. <laughs> okay. So invest as such. In invest accordingly and, and try to preserve your buying power um, during all this crazy stuff. Uh, Crypto Gamer 420 just said that IOHK just tweeted, hard fork successful, delighted to report around 1944 UTC. We, were, we successfully forked Alonzo Testnet to the new Alonzo White node. The new network is happily making blocks. Sweet. Uh, so that's good. Um, I'll tell you what, let's do just a quick pricing rundown. We did our little bank spiel. And then we will talk about uh, what is our cognitive bias for today? Our cognitive bias is, ooh, the illusion of asymmetric insight. People tend to perceive their knowledge of their peers to surpass their peers' knowledge of them. Basically, I think I know more about you than you think you know about me. And I think we all kind of like, I know what you're thinking. No. Well, the dumber people are, the more likely it is that you will know what they're thinking. Um, but – it de that's depends on a lot of things. Okay, uh, let's talk prices for a second, and then we will do some cognitive bias, and I'll let you guys get out along your day. Uh, the Bitcoin is down a little bit. Everything's down. It's kind of a quiet day, kind of quiet. Uh, 31.6, I'm hoping it breaches 30 so I can sell some puts. I didn't sell any this week. I was kept waiting for this, this dip, this grayscale dip that's not really coming. It's just been languishing. My guess is we get a we get a leg down in Bitcoin. We probably see 28k again. For those of you with leverage, please be careful. You're going to get nuked again. Don't get nuked again, even though you're going to get nuked again. Okay, uh, the Ethereum 19 uh, 1903 bucks is down about four and a half percent. Smart contracts are getting beat up a little bit, down about the same. Cardano 1.2, sorry, a uh, buck 22. Um, but, 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 but still the best performer on the year of those smart contract platforms. Uh, the dot 13 bucks is almost in the $12 range. I'm adding to dot. Um, uh, so here's what I'm adding to. I'm adding to Cardano. I'm adding to dot. Um, I probably will add some Ethereum. I'm just going to add across the smart contract space. I just want to kind of bolster that position. You say, where are you adding from? Well, I still have winners and I'm just doing some rebalancing. And if I put two tokens together and I think this one's better than that one, I'll just push some over. Uh, Matic is down about six minutes. Matic and Dot both have an almost a 7% down day. Um, they both had a bad week. If we're being honest, they've had a pretty bad week. Theta really getting bludgeoned. But if Theta gets near three bucks again, I'm a buyer. Um, but it would have to get in the $3 range again. Uh, not until then. Their staking is terrible. Um, platform cool, staking terrible. Okay. Uh, VChain, we wait for it three to four cents. 
Um, and I hope some people took profit on V chain because it, it's giving all of it back. Um, Cosmos gets below 10. I'm a buyer. Um, I didn't exit at the top. I exited at 20, 20. I'd have to look, I think 23, it got up to like 29 for a second, but, uh, under $10, I'm a buyer of Cosmos again. It's a protocol layer. I want to own it. Uh, engine, engine's actually kind of held up pretty well. It's been kind of just flat. Um, I did exit engine just because I thought that candle had burnt most of its wick out, and I'm going to wait until these markets kind of pick a direction. Um, yeah, we're just all pivoting off of Bitcoin. You know, it's down three, so is Bitcoin. 3.6. So 3.6 is kind of the line in the sand. So you want to be looking at assets that didn't that are if it if it's gone down less than 3.6, it's actually doing pretty good. So Nexo is doing good. Uh OGN, surprisingly, doing pretty good. Uh it's up a quarter on the week. It's up nine on the day. Pretty cool. Near it's down five. So it's down, it's doing a little worse. These protocol layers are not having a lot of love right now. Um, near under two bucks. I like it. It's good staking. And I'm just going to continue to collect some yield. Flow has been having a, a pretty good kind of march upward. It's up five on the day, almost 30 on the week. Pretty cool. Um, it keeps kind of grinding up uh, back from kind of getting beat up down from like 35 bucks. Uh, graph tokens getting punished kind of right along the lines. Telcoin, no one cares. Rune is under six bucks. That's my buying range. So I am. And, you know. Again, I'm dollar cost averaging, so I'm buying little bits. I'm not like, you hear me saying I'm buying. Like, where does the endless money come from? It's not endless money, but like with staking rewards, if I get staking rewards with Cardano, I'll take those rewards and I'll spread them out among a bunch of other things. And so I kind of use my staking rewards to do my rebalancing. So every two to three days, I get stake, or every three days, I get staking rewards on Polkadot. Every five days, I get staking rewards on Cardano and every blah, blah, blah. And so that's how I reinvest. I, I, there you go. There you go, folks. Okay. Um, AR Weave, uh, it's it's kind of where I would like it to be to invest. I'm going to probably wait. I, th I think this thing has to come down. Uh, one inch is too cheap. Well, it's not too cheap. It's priced correctly, but it's down at four and a half. Um, I don't know. I'd kind of like to add there because they keep doing cool stuff. Uh, Audius, man, it's way down. It was doing so great. But it's got a tiny, tiny little market cap, and the staking is really good. So I'm going to keep collecting the staking, and I'm going to sell the staking rewards and use that to buy other things. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, fetch, I believe that these are always undervalued, the AI plays. You can buy Fetch and AGIX on the cheap. Render keeps going up because pff, awesome. Um, 67 is almost 70 cents. Are you kidding me? Um, so we're doing good off that. For, uh, we started – I don't know if you guys remember where we started in on render, but we we started in around the 48, 47, 48 cent mark. So that's been a pretty good move. We've we've gotten, depending on where you got into render, if you got into it, we're we're you know, we're banging on 50%. Um, but I think this thing does really well. And I think it's got honestly, I think it has an easy 10x by the end of the year. Again, don't take my advice, don't do anything I do. Just say why? Why does he like that? Why is that interesting? And then you go to your own research. Find out if you like it. Uh, new kind of failure. It's oddly having an okay day. It's not down. So cool. Um, Matrix AI. It's having an up day, which makes no sense because it's dog trash. Uh, AGIX. Very quiet. Doesn't even show a market cap. Um, a lot of this is is waiting for Card for Cardano to roll out Alonzo, and so we're still a month and a half. Let's see. We're mid July, August for six weeks out. We're six weeks out from meaningful smart contract deployment. I mean, meaningful where the whole world can use it. And then these governments start onboarding and things like that. So um, continue to build. And then S Dow, it's down on the day 10%, but it's still up a five and a half X, almost exactly five and a half X, 20 cents to a buck 10. It was like a buck 20 earlier this morning. So everything is getting beat up right now. So if you have, if you are looking where to enter, everything looks pretty good, but certain things look better. 
Um, so you just have to decide where you're light in your portfolio, and that's how you rebalance. Okay, cool, bro. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, Gabby Alvarez, good to see you. Uh, Hootie, good to see you. I'm just – let's see. Uh, FPS Hydro, good to see you. And who did I miss? Oh, DJ Wyatt, good to see you. Tescos, Katome, uh, bop, 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 29 LH06, Flabic, Joe Pirate. Got to get all my peeps. Got to remember all the peeps. And uh, let's see, wait until people wake up and see the food agriculture systems, both made up of oil supply chains, government subsidies. Yeah, man, the whole thing's a mess. Gosh, but it is, it's the new normal. So, so what, right? So what? Um, okay, and then what happens when you sell puts at 30K? Uh, if you sell puts at 30K, it means you're agreeing to purchase Bitcoin at 30K. Even if the price is beneath 30K, they'll pay you the premium. I'm just trying to wait until Bitcoin drops below 30K to sell the 30Ks so that I can get the biggest chunk of premium. So I'll probably start looking at tomorrow's contract right now, the one for next week that opens tomorrow. Um, and that's that's the way I'll play it. Uh, yeah. BZ, what up? Okay. Yeah. Lower quality life. Got Okay. So let's talk. Let me do – let me stop this screen share. Let me share – let me share some. Ooh, the illusion of asymmetric insight. Let me put our little banner up there. We got a banner. We got a we got a banner. We got everything. This is this is some real stuff. Boop. And then by the way, next week we're going to be covering self-serving bias, the illusion of truth effect, the spotlight effect. We may even get into some survivorship bias, but for now, the illusion of asymmetric insight. I'm going to cover this pretty quickly, but it's important. Um, it is people tend to perceive their knowledge of their peers, the people around you, as being higher than or surpassing their peers' knowledge of them. Example, when you're having an argument with somebody, it's common to tell them what they are like in great detail because clearly they have very little self-awareness and self-knowledge. You do understand them, but they don't understand you. They're, they're plebeians. They're, they're simple rubes. Likewise, as they argue back, they're going to tell you things about yourself that, that are clearly wrong or that you knew anyway, right? And I find this tragically disproportionate among people that fancy themselves quite intelligent, right? It's this injury through intelligence, and you see how it makes its way into a lot of these biases. When you think you are smarter mm, – when you think you're smarter than the aggregate, you tend to assume that that means you're smarter in everything. You're smarter in psychology. You're smarter in, in, in health. You're smarter in entrepreneurship. You're smarter in vascular surgery and neuropathy. And like, no, like we all are good at very interesting and unique things. Even if our IQs are not equal, we all have things that we kind of niche specialize in. And it makes us all kind of experts in very interesting things. But but it makes us not experts in everything, right? There are all sorts of things that every single person here that can listen to this is probably better. Every one of you here, I would wager, everybody here is better at something. Something could be very obscure or random, but some everybody here is better than everybody else here at something. And – but if you get any two people together, one person is going to think they know more about the other person, the other person. And so you always want to kind of pay attention to this, right? Don't, don't assume – it's like a, a triathlete. You're really good at swimming, so you assume, oh, I'm obviously the best in the world at running and also at biking. No, they're completely different. They're all in the realm of fitness and competitive fitness, but they're all completely different. They require different groups of muscles and different cardiac capacity and, and ability and all these kinds of things and balance and all. Um, muscle, you know, aerobic activity is muscle and sport specific. And so that's – anyway, I digress. Don't fall victim to the illusion of asymmetric insight. And embedded in that is this injury by intelligence, right? Thinking if I know this thing, I know all things. Or if I'm good at these two things, I'm good at all of these things. And that's just not the case. 
Um, this seems obvious. I mean, I guess it kind of starts to hearken on or, or like knock on the door of like narcissistic, narcissistic tendencies and things like that. Um, anyway, uh, this seems obvious. We know ourselves better than others know us, or do we? There's an entire field of medicine and therapy, psychology, and psychiatry that would argue otherwise. There's a quote that I like to remind myself of on a regular basis. Epictetus, if you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid with regard to external things. This is important. Listen again. If you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid with regard to external things. Don't wish to be thought to know anything. And even if you appear to, to be somebody important to others, distrust yourself. For it is difficult to keep both your faculty of choice in a state of com in a state of uh, in a state conformable to nature, and at the same time acquire external things. But while you are careful about the one, you must, of necessity, neglect the other. Epictetus, committed to memory. This is an important one. Just you can just get the first part right. If you want to improve, be content to be thought foolish and stupid with regard to external things. We all. We all have to come to terms with the notion, at least the possibility, that we may, we may be wrong about ourselves. Or perhaps we have an understanding of certain things related to us that may be glaring and obvious to others that we uh, fail to fully realize. You know, sometimes our own psychological biases are like a big giant sign that you wear on your back, and you can't see it. But everyone else can. And we all have these things. And it's just… Uh, try to absorb these things. Don't don't defend against them. I know it's a, it's kind of against our self esteem to, for any of us to act, you know, be, you know, honest with ourselves and admit we have all these kind of failings. But if if one person at the water cooler says something, they could be an a hole. If five people say something about you, maybe you're the a hole, right? Let's be open to it. Be open to the fact that even in criticism, there might be some truth. Mostly there is. Um, so the only way to be better at anything, trading, dating, lifing is to allow yourself to be audited and edited, open yourself up to being wrong about things. You should be happy to have your flaws pointed out as quickly as possible, uh, for you'll quickly be able to make adjustments and improve, right? Be content to be thought foolish and stupid in the crypto space. I find this incredibly important. People get very tribal. We talk about XRP and link and all these idiot groups. But even in idiot groups doesn't mean everybody in the group's an idiot. Might be nobody in the group's an idiot. They might have been sold the hopes and the dreams and the fairy dust, and they just don't want to give up hope. There's a great line in Gorky Park. I think it's Gorky Park. And the line is something to do with uh, it's better to have, to, to have hope than truth. Or it's, it, it's better to believe a lie if the lie gives you hope than to believe the truth if the truth is devoid of hope, right? Some people would rather just believe the lie because they feel better. They sleep better at night, right? People get very tribal, almost religious about coins and tokens they like. This can cause you to only pay attention to news that supports your ideas, confirmation bias, but it's not doing you any favors. You should communicate with your peers, other traders, advisors, consultants, friends, Etc. And you should ask them about their strategies and weigh those against uh, their success, like verifiable success, not their outrageous claims. Like, I got rich off Safe Moon, bro. What's rich? I made three grand. That's not rich, dude. That's you don't retire. So, you know, let's let's wise up. Uh, looking at looking at those uh, with continued success and be open to seeing holes in your own strategies, mistake you might uh, mistakes you might unconsciously be making um, as advice of your peers and listen, actually listen to people that you see that are successful. Don't do what they say. Just listen to them and try to absorb some of their patterns of thinking. And then if they get blown up in their career, you need to go, uh Oh, <laughs> do I have some of those patterns of thinking that could get me blown up in my career? Are they, are they making standard deviations from rational thought, which is these Cognitive bias, right? Little derivations in thinking that create standard or or kind of statistical deviations, right? We want to approach life with a balance of like game theoretics 
economics. I'm just talking about our investment life. You can do whatever the hell you want in your private life. But investment life, you want to use game theory, basic economics, the assumption that most players are rational. And if not, that if the prevailing theory is irrationality, okay, that's fine. How are you going to behave in an irrational society? Because even in, in, in big giant pockets of irrational behavior, there are trends that you can witness and you can say, okay, right now, this is the trend. This doesn't mean this is the truth. It means it's the right now truth. Just be willing to shift and change. So ask advice of your peers, listen to what they're doing, try to verify their successes, but don't copy, right? If you want to copy someone, try to figure out where their brain is at and try to copy kind of those, the modality of thinking. Try to, try, to, try to ingratiate some of their thinking patterns or the way they analyze. That's, that's how you beat the system. You just figure out what the smartest people, the way they think, and you try, to, you try to kind of absorb those thinking patterns and put those into your, your heuristics, your patterns of thinking, right? Okay. Um, the art to game theory is making the most educated decision possible with the information you have at your disposal and assuming that those you're competing with will also do the same. In order to do this, you need to be at your best in the right headspace to analyze existing data correctly. I mean, it's getting rid of all the emotion in your decisions, having others identify and point out flaws in your analysis or your process, and that can save you a lot of time and money. Cool? Okay. Ooh, next week we're going to start with self-serving bias, but not yet. Stop that screen share. Stop it. And yeah, let's go ahead and call it a day. Was there anything interesting over on Cointelegraph Pro? Uh, Axie Infinity is still way up. Listen, if you got into this last week, you got in around 17 bucks. It's 26 bucks. It was 27 earlier. Man, you made like 40%. That's a pretty great week, friends. That's a pretty great week. So, yeah. Um, Polygon, let's see. Matic and E&J deposits. Start trading for new. Uh, don't care. Staking OXT on the Orchid network. No one cares. That's not fair. Very few people care. <laughs> uh, Avalanche staking via delegation is now live on the stake DAO. Very few people care. Okay. Well, you care about what you care about. Um Let's, I've noticed a bias towards yoga pants. Oh, oh, we all have. We all have. None of you can be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think maybe the way to say it, Antonio, is there's no such thing as an expert. Um, it's just a, con it's like a conveyor belt. And sometimes you find yourself at the top of a pile of other people that are on a conveyor belt. And for brief moments, you may, you might have more subject matter knowledge than other people. I spend more time just trying to think about thinking and less time thinking about specific things. Because the way I look at it is critical thinking and kind of having a relatively grounded scientific mind are much more important than any specific bits of information. I can't memorize all this stuff. I'm not like Jeff Snyder. Jeff Snyder can basically tell you every minute of every Fed meeting ever. And he knows the charts that go with it. He, that's how his brain, his brain is built differently than mine. So it, I can study. You guys see that? That was so weird. I got booted. Huh? That's never happened. Anyway, yeah. uh, for those of you that can hear, I got booted from the broadcast based on some kind of weirdness. Uh-oh, talking about the wrong things. I should never mention the Fed. Anyway, uh, I'll, I'll wrap this up, but I've just spent most of my recent life, like the last few years, just thinking about thinking. <laughs> yeah, I just bailed. I was like, I'm out. I'm done. Um, so I urge you guys to, to end gals and pronouns and undisclosed to spend some time thinking about thinking, right? 
be a student of cognitive bias, be a student of the scientific method, be a student of the process of trying to think about the way that you think, the way that you form ideas, the way that you form judgments. Try to be curious, not judgmental, right? Curious, not judgmental. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Um, you're better off going into every situation thinking, uh, I might not have all the information rather than, oh, I definitely have the information. If you think about thinking, then all of these little bits and pieces of the economy and all this, they're just, you just factor them into your decision making, right? But if you're just thinking about the information itself, you may be missing the greater story. And that's all I have to say about that. Uh, have a great day. Stay out of trouble. Uh, don't do what my porn solvent drunk, strung out of meth grandmother would do. Don't do anything she wouldn't do, and it doesn't leave very much. Uh, she angel dusted it last night. We cleaned her face off, and we're like, "What are the? What's that little thing?" You know, Grandma. She had like some little red. She's like, "I've been crushing that crystal." I'm like, "Oh, Grandma." So I've got her smoking liquid this morning. So that's gonna hopefully she'll be bring her back down a little bit. Smoking that water. All right, we'll see you guys next week. I will post. Uh, for those of you that don't uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, you don't follow me on Twitter. I don't really say anything useful, but I do post the Monday and the Friday shows from Money Map Press on Twitter. And if you want those shows, either be on the Twitter with me or be on the Telegram group, Crypto in Coffee. So t.me slash crypto in, not I in, but in coffee, Crypto in Coffee or Krypton Coffee, whatever. Anyway, there you go. Bye. Time to chit chat. You know nothing about blockchain. We here to fix that. You want the news on them new stocks? This where you get that. So go and grab you a nice chair. It's time to sit back and talk to profit. Hey, hey, you talking to the profit? Hey, hey, you talk? We talking condos and nice clothes and dropping Lambos. I remember them night codes. We couldn't stand those. We tried to drop on them house roads, but had to stay low. Now there's solutions to hard bills we couldn't. I talked to profit to get some profit, we couldn't change the top. If it's a stock and I need a cop it, I wait for him to drop it. Ain't no option, let's get it poppin', we chillin' in the drop. I need some crypto playin' in my pocket, by any means I rock. This is the profit with Nick Black, it's time to chit chat. You know nothing about blockchain, we here to fix that. You want the news on them new stocks, this where you get that. So go and grab you a nice chair, it's time to sit back and talk to profit. Hey, hey, you talkin' to the profit. Hey, hey, you talking to the prop? <laughs> it's all fake news. It's phony stuff. It didn't happen.